sorry, that's us back uh, for after our little uh, break. I hope you all got yourself a cup of coffee or whatever. Um, what Joanna, the poem was actually the third place uh, poem. We had a poetry competition. So that poem actually ended up being placed third. And it was a specific request that, that Jim Loudon had made for, for me to write an ode. So that's what the, that poem. And I assure you that the, the second place poem and the first place poem and the poem we have during the course of the session will all be improvements on that uh, poetry. Um, but uh, it's nice that we're kicking off this session section with a talk from Jim Loudon. Um, now, many of you who have been involved in the Mechanics Institute uh, do know uh, Jim. He's, um, he's, he's almost the, the, the holder of the, of the key for some of this for a lot of people. Um, and he uh, has this, uh, coordinates the, 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 the magazine, um, the fusion of useful knowledge. So he has this publication that comes out and he's going to, uh, uh, or at least his daughter is going to uh, go through his lecture uh, on his behalf uh, uh, about Henry Brougham. So uh, with that, we can go to the lecture. Henry Peter Brougham was born at Edinburgh in 1778. He was to develop six lifelong overlapping consuming passions, abolition of slavery, universal free education, promotion of science, political and law reform, and the diffusion of useful knowledge. A child prodigy from age seven, he spent the following six years at Royal High School, Edinburgh, where the charismatic Dr. Alexander Adam excited an ardent love of the subjects he taught, and Brougham emerged as ducks. In 1792, he was enrolled at the University of Edinburgh in a general arts course with a dazzling staff of lecturers, surrounded by an equally brilliant student cohort. On graduating, he then took up a law course. Fellow graduate George Birkbeck accepted a position in late 1799 at Anderson's University in Glasgow as Professor of Natural Philosophy, as science was then known, and started to run evening classes for mechanics in early 1800. Brom was admitted to the Scottish Bar in 1800, but briefs were few for a Whig barrister in Scotland. Consequently, he hoped for some diplomatic posting and he started to write a book on colonial policy. In the meantime, three of Brom's contemporaries, Francis Horner, Francis Jeffrey, and Sidney Smith, were canvassing the idea of restarting the long defunct Edinburgh Review. They had secured the backing of publisher Archibald Constable and invited Brom to join them. Brom contributed six papers in the first issue. In another paper, Francis Horner reviewed Alexander Christensen's general diffusion of knowledge, one great cause of the prosperity of Northern Britain. The first number of the revived Edinburgh Review appeared on 10th of October 1802 and it proved an immediate success, continued to appear quarterly. From then on, Brom continued to skillfully use the Edinburgh Review, mainstream newspapers and strategic pamphlets to promote his various causes. Brom published an inquiry into the colonial policy of the European powers in 1803, and so as not to sink to the muddy bottom of Scots law, he moved to London and entered his name on the roll at Lincoln's Inn in January 1804. His notoriety as an author and as a newly elected fellow of the Royal Society had preceded arrival in London, and soon he was introduced to anti-slavery's William Wilberforce and was drawn into the Holland House Whig political set. Education was emerging as a major issue in the early 1800s, firstly with Peel's Health and Morals of Apprentices Act in 1802, followed by Lancaster's book Improvements in Education in 1803. Then there was the landmark Leeds Grammar School case and Whitbread's unsuccessful parochial schools bill in 1807. Brown was called to the English Bar in November 1808 and in the following month chaired a meeting to consider the future financing and restructuring of the Royal Lancastrian Association of Schools. In addition to the existing schools, two groups that were to provide basic education then emerged, the National Society in 1811 and the British and Foreign Society in 1813. Following Sir Samuel Whitbread's suicide, in July 1815, Brahms became education spokesman in Parliament. In 1816, he succeeded in having a committee of inquiry established to investigate an, the existing state of education in London, and he chaired that committee. 
In 1818, Brougham issued a letter to Sir Samuel Romilly upon the abuse of charities, which detailed gross rortings of charitable education funds. A letter went through many printings and resulted in widespread self-regulation, the passing of the Charitable Foundations Bill in 1819. Brougham proposed the Parish Schools Bill of 1820, but it failed to gain support. However, he still pursued the cause of infant education with an article in the Edinburgh Review in, 1820, in 1823 and the establishment of the Infant School Society in June 1824. In the meantime, another strand of education was emerging. The Edinburgh School of Arts had been established in 1821 and its success had been replicated in Glasgow, Liverpool and then London, all set up in 1823. Brougham saw these models on which to promote the Mechanics Institute movement. Typically, he started with an article in the October 1824 Edinburgh Review titled Hints to Philanthropists or a Collective View of Practical Means of Improving the Condition of the Poor and Labouring Classes of Society, which was under the pen name of William Davis. This article subsequently published as a pamphlet in 1825 under the working title, Practical Observations Upon the Education of the People Addressed to the Working Classes and Their Employers, advocated the cheap publishing of part works and texts and lampooned the paper tax as a tax on knowledge. It advocated the establishment of libraries, book clubs and reading societies by way of low membership fees for many people, so many people could be exposed to books and knowledge. Lectures on subjects beneficial to industry and other topics could be added and generic lecture notes could be compiled and distributed for reading to classes. Brom concluded his pamphlet with, to the other classes of society, then I would say that the question no longer is whether or not the people shall be instructed, but whether they should be will or well or ill taught. And to the working classes, I would say that this is the time when by a great effort they may secure for even the inestimable blessing of knowledge. Practical Observations has gone through 25 revised editions by the end of 1825, and it's sold around the world in other editions and translations. As the Mechanics Institute's able protect, um, propagandist, Brougham travelled the length and breadth of Britain promoting the benefits of institutes, opening new institutes and or delivering keynote lectures in them. The Mechanics Institute movement had its detractors, but its halls provided a safe place for the working classes to gather and rationally debate or discuss the issues of the day. Whilst Brown was widely regarded as being a radical, he was a pacifist and declared war is a crime which involves all other crimes. Furthermore, he believed that an educated and enlightened working class would contribute to political and social tranquility. The move to a produced cheap editions came in the form of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, SEDUC, established in 1826 and chaired by Brown. From the outset, its policy eschewed religion and party politics, and it assembled an array of benefactors and creators. Brown wrote SEDUC's first booklet, Objects, Advantages and Pleasures of Science. SEDUC recruited publisher Charles Knight and steam printer William Clowes to economically produce illustrated publications. Sadak set a cracking pace publishing textbooks, part works and maps and this gave rise to it being called the Steam Intellect Society. The hugely successful Penny magazine was started in 1832 and by the year's end reached a circulation of 200,000 copies weekly. In keeping with the promotion of education, it started the Quarterly Journal of Education in 1831. This contributed no doubt to the passing of the Education Bill of 1833 and the first government financial vote for education. Sadak books, periodicals and almanacs and maps were soon to be found in libraries and reading rooms around the world. Sadak's meticulous maps were widely used. In the 20th edition of Practical Observations published in 1825, the last page carries a footnote since this work was first published, I'm happy to say that considerable progress has been made in maturing a plan for improving the education in the middle and upper classes by establishing a university in London. Meanwhile, in January 1825, Brahman invited, had invited Charles, uh, Thomas Campbell, James Mill, Joseph Hume and Lord King to dinner. The university matter was clearly discussed for Campbell then wrote an open letter to Brahman which appeared in the Times of 9th of February 1825, so the flame was ignited. In his usual style, Brown set fervishly to work by, but received opposition and rebuttals on all fronts. However, 
New company legislation provided an opening by way of the joint stock company and the share issue. Launched on 11th of February 1826, the establishment of the new University of London was a massive task. Leonard Horner was recruited as warden and a wide range of faculties was proposed, which included medicine and law. Brown preempted the university's launch with an address to the Crown at the opening of Parliament on 28th of January 1828, which in part reads, the country sometimes heard with dismay that the soldier is abroad. Now there is another person abroad, the schoolmaster is abroad, and I trust more to, be, to the schoolmaster armed with his primer than to the soldier in full military array. Then having regard to the establishment of a chair in law at the new university, Brom gave his marathon six hour speech in the House of Commons on 7th of February, 1828. Entitled The Present State of Law, the speech contained the notable quote, education makes a people easy to lead, but difficult to drive, easy to govern, but impossible to enslave. Against all odds, the University of London opened on the 1st of October, 1828. It was referred to as the godless institution of Gower Street for entry did not require any religious qualification. The University of London was a success and so much so it was soon joined by King's College in 1829. Both emerged in 1836 to form the University of London with two constituent parts, University College and King's College London. The year of 1830 was pivotal in Brougham's life. He was elected for a seat in Yorkshire and the country was hell-bent on the reform of Parliament with wider franchise. Whilst legislation could pass the Commons, there was no way it was going to pass through the House of Lords where the landed families held sway. The narrative relates that Brougham was virtually forced to take a seat in the House of Lords as Lord Chancellor, thus sidelining him. However, the Whigs were in for a shock as Sidney Smith diarised, look at the gigantic Brougham, sworn in at 12 o'clock and before 6pm he had a bill on the table abolishing the abuses of a court which had been the curse of England for centuries. Then Brougham tenaciously chartered the Reform Bill through the House of Lords to achieve the 1832 Reform Act. That said, Brougham never remained idle for promoting law and electoral reform, education, science and anti-slavery, or while in France at Cairns lobbying for a railway, a harbour or a water supply to the remote coastal town, all of which he achieved. Then in spite of being regarded as a spent force in, in his 80th year, Brougham headed to the National Association for Promotion of Social Science in 1857. Their annual Congress itinerated to major cities around Britain and assembled the best minds, including women, from around the world to lecture. Thousands attended and the proceedings were also published wide and widely distributed. And what of the legacy of Brougham and his practical observations upon the education of the people? The creation of some 12,000 institutes across Britain and around the world, which in addition to providing a hall, also extended opportunities for technical education, libraries, museums, art galleries, church, civic and school use. There was also early trade exhibitions, reciprocal visits by train and the creation of a speech or lecture circuits, competitive visits by debating, billiards, chess, drafts or even darts teams. Halls provided venues for local theatrical and musical groups, dancers, travelling entertainers and film screening sites. In Australia, their untied screens meant promoters could show films from any producer. This enabled the development of a local film industry. It's perhaps somewhat ironic that the world's largest film festival is staged at Cannes on the French Riviera, for it is here that only the only statue of Brahm exists. Replaced after its World War II removal, it holds pride of place in the town centre to commemorate Le Père de Caen, the man who was first found the small, fish, small fishing village in 1835. Brahms Cairns Chateau, Eleanor Louise, still stands, but it, at his Penrith seat of Brougham Hall, once known as the Windsor of the North, all that remains is a ruin of the library wing that was only saved when a workman was killed while attempting to raise it in its final stations of demolition in 1934. The huge corpus of Brougham's books, pamphlets and cartoons remained, along with the large archive of his papers held at University College London, all go to help document one of the most epic periods of British and world history. Then there are more than 50 institutes that evolved into or emerged to become major technical universities throughout the world, which Harriet Watt and Birkbeck are exemplars. 
Similarly, thousands of village halls can trace their origins back to Mechanics Institute's beginning. And at the time of Brom's death, William Forster was advancing Brom's elusive elementary education bill, which was finally passed in 1870. These are but parts of the legacy of the man who bestrode British public life like a colossus for 60 plus years and challenged everyone to try to know everything of something and something of everything. Brom died at Cairns on the 17th of May, 1868, and was buried there. His grave is marked with a large dark white marble cross carrying the simple inscription, Henricus Brom. A motion in the British Parliament to place a commemorative plaque in, to Brom in Westminster Abbey was defeated. Thanks very much for that, Brom. That's very nice of you to record your father's uh, lecture. And I hope that either you or your father will be around uh, to, to comment on uh, things that come through the chat. Um, there's a point that was made uh, earlier, I guess. Um, somebody talking about this technical teacher, this is Phil Warren raised an issue, uh, which sort of relates to what we were talking about before the break. but. You know, as a technical teacher, saying that somebody who had a high school education uh, wasn't until the 1890s that technical education had entry classes that matched the students. So it's almost like, you know, these these well-to-do people were setting up uh, educational establishments for the mechanics or for the working people, um, and uh, you know, they were, didn't necessarily know that that's what they wanted. You know, um, so it's it's quite interesting. We're not able to appreciate the level that the lectures were being given at. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, Steve, Steve W out there has um, uh, made another point. Sydney, uh, this is a, around Sydney, um, saying that, uh, uh, you know, Sydney contributed to the development of state and technical ed education, addressed uh, the mechanics, um, as well as the universities, and it led to institutes to concentrate more on social issues. So I think, I think, you know, many of these things were set up for the mechanics, but they became more for the social issues, libraries and community edu education. And, uh, and I know that we, we talked, uh, the principal first thing this morning said there are 33 uh, universities that have come out of the Mechanics Institute, but we're also going to hear later on from, from, from people where the, you know, the, the Marsden uh, Institute is, is more of a social center. So. I think these are these are very diverse rules at uh, roles. So so um, Br Brown is somebody that I'd never really he heard of before. But then I'm a geologist and not a historical uh, expert. But uh, it seems to me that he's somebody that we uh, uh, should uh, make more news of in the in the UK in in, in adult education. It's nice to see. Um, so Jim. Um, would you like to come on and, 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 and uh, pick up some of these comments? You need to unmute if you're if still out there. No, okay. Well, uh, I don't. I don't see Jim coming on. Maybe that uh, he he might he or Abron might come on later. But I think uh, with that we'll we'll get ready to move on to the next talk, which is also coming from down under, uh, and then we'll have a period of discussion. So maybe uh, thinking about the more general discussion points uh, at, at that point. Um, all right. So Jim is there. Jim, did you want to comment? Um, Patrick, on the on the technical side, most of the major cities in Victoria. Um, they, the technical schools actually grew out of the mechanics institutes at Bendigo, Ballarat, Warrnambool, Sale, um, and, and Melbourne, of course. And it generally was a school of arts where drawing and, and, uh, and uh, art instructions were given. And then it, it grew into more um, technical subjects, the metalwork and that type, woodwork and that type of thing. Okay, so you're saying it, it, in some of these it started the other way around. It was more arts, and then moving into the more mechanical subjects, you know, which is yes. interesting. And mm. that that's the other way around from what we were hearing this morning, where it was set up for mostly the 
you know, the chemistry and the mechanics and, 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 and then it moved more into the art. So, um, okay, anyway, it was very nice to see you on this uh, talk because, uh, you know, Jim, you were the one who uh, kicked the whole ball rolling when you asked if I would get involved and uh, set, the, set this up. So it's very nice to see you uh, on, on, the, on the call and hopefully you can take part. Uh, there is a question from Gavin. Um, are you wearing Gordon clan tartan? Campbell of Loudon. Campbell of Loudon. Okay, so we uh, we should have asked everybody to come to this meeting in their their tartan. Um, we do have a Harriet Watt tartan, uh, but I'm not sure we have a Mechanics Institute tartan. But maybe somebody will will, will put together one for us all. 